Okay, so um, what we're now doing is beginning on um, the second uh, big subsection of the course. In um, each of the remaining three subsections of the course, what we'll be doing is examining a, um, an important tradition in moral theory. To see, in a general way, um, what these traditions in moral theory are, what you can, um, the way to think about it is, um, there are um, a number of central questions that um, moral philosophers and moral philosophies um, tend to set out to answer, right? They would include the questions what kind of thing is morality? What sorts of things are moral rules? And the question, just what is the content of morality? Just exactly what does morality tell us to do? And the question, why should we do that? What reason or motive is there for doing what morality requires? of You might add to that, but that's a decent... Um, set of sort of three central questions that moral philosophers and moral philosophies set out to address. You can then think of each of these traditions in moral theory as um, connected bodies of ideas that um, in their distinctive way aim to offer answers to these questions. For each of these um, traditions in moral theory, what we'll do is we will both look at um, a central figure in the history of moral philosophy, sort of representative of the tradition, and we'll then go on to um, think about um, contemporary debates in moral philosophy about the merits of that kind of tradition, that kind of approach. The first of these um, traditions, approaches in moral theory that we're going to look at is the um, egoist and contractualist tradition. Um, and I should probably give you a sense of um, at least the first part of our agenda here. So I've got one of these agenda slides. There we go. Um, so, um, theorists in this um, contractualist egoist tradition um, typically embrace uh, 
three key central ideas which we'll both see at work in Hobbes and then look at the independent merits of. Right? So they typically embrace um, two versions of egoism and um, this idea about the nature of morality called the social contract theory of morals. Right? So begin with the two versions of egoism. If we can pop over to the uh, PowerPoint. Cool, thanks. So um, the, these two versions of egoism uh, can be seen as, you know, setting a kind of challenging background on which to construct a moral theory, right? Um, one way of seeing the challenge is to think that we ordinarily suppose that um, morality requires us sometimes to act contrary to our own interests and um, in ways that put our interests aside in favor of those of others. But if you embrace these two forms of egoism, such behavior is um, neither rational nor possible. So it may seem this egoistic foundation leaves no room for a um, concept of morality. But you see, then the, um, the, the contractualist move aims to show you that, no, there, there is room, right? On this contractualist account, what morality is, is it's the product of a mutually beneficial agreement. You make the argument that really, even to, um, even when we're just concerned for our own interest, we'd be worse off if everyone didn't restrain their behavior towards other people. So morality is, arises from a kind of agreement, a kind of deal, whereby each of us agrees to restrain our behavior towards others if they restrain their behavior towards us. This is the idea of the social contract theory of morals. That's the other key defining idea in this tradition.
So we'll explore um, this tradition first as we find it in the most um, celebrated uh, historical exemplar of this line of thought, Thomas Hobbes. Let me say um, something more by way of uh, historical and biographical introduction to Hobbes. Uh, you, you've read a brief extract from his most famous work, Leviathan, which you, um, you, you found on the, the course website. So, um, Hobbes, Thomas Hobbes, um, English moral and political philosopher, lived from 1588 to 1679. And his most famous work that we're reading this short bit of is The Leviathan, uh, first published in 1651. He lived through um, a turbulent period of uh, English history, right? He lived through specifically the period of um, the Civil War, pitting the Royalist forces under Charles I against the parliamentary forces under Oliver Cromwell, right? The parliamentary victory, the establishment of the Commonwealth from know, roughly 1648 to 1660, and then the restoration of the monarchy under Charles II um, starting in 1660. Hobbes was, um, oh, by inclination and um, employment, uh, very much on the royalist side, right? So he spent, um, basically spent his working life as a private tutor to three generations of an aristocratic royalist family. Um, and uh, Leviathan was actually published in France when he was in exile there after the, um, after the parliamentary victory. Um, Hobbes' relations though actually with um, orthodox representatives of uh, royalist thought were rather uneasy, right? Um, so, though Hobbes, and these are aspects of his work that we're not going to focus closely on, though Hobbes is a um, defender of absolute uh, monarchical power, right? He doesn't defend it in the way that the orthodox royalists typically did, right? So the orthodox royalist line was um, to invoke the divine right of kings. Yeah? So the idea was that, you know, uh, God installed whoever the, you know, relevant earliest um, English or British or whatever monarch was, right? And then this um, divine right passes down the, uh, you know, the, the line of succession, right? Be a tricky theory to work out given all these dubious succession moves. If you know the the bits of English history and you know the, you know Henry the Seventh and his really dubious claim to the throne and whatnot. But anyway, I mean that that's the line, right? Um, by contrast, right? I mean, there's way in which Hobbes. Um, derives the king's authority or the monarch's authority sort of from the people, right? I mean, the thought is that um, the, um, you know, the monarch's authority arises from, um, you know, the ability to protect everyone on some sort of agreement, right? And orthodox royalists thought this was giving too much to the other side, right? Um, one, uh, um, there's a bishop, Bishop Bramhall, with whom Hobbes clashed in a number of ways. And um, on this issue, uh, Bramhall re referred to the Leviathan as, quote, a rebel's catechism, right? Because it was giving far too much to those who would justify rebellion. Um, so, you know, Hobbes, you know, is, I mean, he's a royalist, but he's not an orthodox royalist, exactly. Um, Hobbes is very much a part of um, the leading intellectual developments of the time, right? Uh, 
these intellectual developments basically involve the rejection of the kind of um, Aristotelian view that we encountered a bit ago, when, you know, briefly when we were talking about natural law theory, the kind of thing that dominated medieval philosophy derived from, um, you know, Aristotle has filtered th through Aquinas, right? And the replacement of that view with um, the kind of uh, materialistic scientific approach that, um, you know, be begins with people like Copernicus, right? Uh, Hobbes, you know, knew was associated with key figures in the development of this um, new intellectual tradition, you know, like the celebrated uh, French philosopher Descartes, right? Philosopher and mathematician is the guy after whom Cartesian coordinates are named, right? Um, indeed, he's the author of um, objections to, uh, I can never remember which one of Descartes' major works it is, the, the principles, I think. One other thing that's worth noting about the intellectual background here um, that y you, you see actually even in this brief extract of Leviathan, um, you'll notice that um, at several important places where Hobbes is um, introducing or defining a key concept, he uh, refers to a Latin terminology, right? You might sort of wonder why that, that was so. And look, here's the answer. Um, up until pretty much the time when Hobbes and Descartes are writing, um, Latin is the, um, it's the language of scholarship across, um, I don't know what the right term is, Western Europe or whatever, right? I mean, so, um, you know, scholars, whether they live in Italy or, you know, France or Germany or England, they all read and do their scholarly work in Latin, right? Now, of course, Latin and Greek go on to, to be cent a central part of um, education well beyond this period, up until, oh, the um, late 19th century. But... It's in this period that, um, you know, uh, philosophers first start to write some of their philosophical work in their native languages, right? Um, so both Hobbes and Descartes do that. Hobbes writes some of his stuff in English and some of it in Latin. Right? The Leviathan is written in English. There are other parallel works that were... Um, written in Latin. There is actually a Latin version of Leviathan as well, but it's later than the English one. Um, similarly for Descartes, there are two major presentations of Descartes' philosophical stuff. One's in Latin, one's in French. Right. Um, so what, what you've got to see is that um, at this point, as it were, there's no established philosophical vocabulary in English or, or French, right? So, it, it, you know, when you're writing philosophy and you want to refer to established philosophical vocabulary, established concepts, the, the language that has those is Latin. So that's why you're going to encounter quite frequently Latin terminology. It's interesting too, I, I, as you'll see, I, I like reading um, bits of Hobbes and I'll, I'll, um, I'll do a bunch of that in just a bit. Um, it's interesting to reflect that though, I, I think he's, a, I mean the punctuation is distinctive and so forth, I've tried to sort it out some for you, but um, though um, I think he's a master of English prose, Hobbes would have received no training whatever in writing in English, right? I mean, all the training he received in writing would, would be writing in Latin and Greek. All right. Um, so, Leviathan is a, I mean, in the original, it's a long book. It has, um, it's divided into four subsections, four books. Um, there's of man, of commonwealth, and I don't remember the names of the other two. The other two concern religious issues, and most contemporary moral and political theorists who look at Hobbes don't think very much about them. I think it's ones of the kingdom of heaven, the others of the kingdom of darkness. Right? 
Um, but it's, you know, it'd be, it's, you, you get sort of standard edition, standard pagination. It's like 650 pages long, right? What I've given you is an extract. This, this, it's like the extract, right, that we used to have in previous editions of The Right Thing to Do that's regrettably disappeared, but I made my own version of it. And it's an extract of some key bits from the very end of book one, which give you um, an important part of the sort of overall argument. That overall argument, and in particular um, the aspects that we're going to look at, can be seen as falling into um, two parts, which we can label um, the problem and the solution. And we'll look at them in turn. Start with the problem here. And I've got a, got a slide for this. All right, so that, you know, I mean, if Hobbes can make that argument, then he's, you know, demonstrated that uh, in this state of nature, under conditions with no government, no moral rules, we'll all be very badly off. So then, second part, the solution involves his sketch of a way that you can kind of get yourself out of this um, very bad state of nature by making a deal that sets up moral rules. And I think I have a slide. Um, yeah, um, we'll, we'll, we'll do more on this in a while, but there's a, um, an initial sketch. All right, so let's then look in detail at um, the first half of that argument, what, what we labeled the problem, Hobbes's argument that um, a state of nature will be a state of war, and so very bad for everybody. 
The central part of this argument is found in chapter 13, that's sort of the, the first half of our extract. Right? Um, Hobbes begins with uh, claims about uh, two kinds of basic human equality, uh, physical equality and mental equality. Right? Um, he starts with uh, physical equality, right? So the very first paragraph of our extract, he writes, Nature hath made men so equal in the faculties of body and mind, as that though there be found one man sometimes manifestly stronger in body or of quicker mind than another, yet when all is reckoned together, the difference between man and man is not so considerable as that one man can thereupon claim to himself any benefit to which another may not pretend as well as he. For as to the strength of body, the weakest has strength enough to kill the strongest, either by secret machination or by confederacy with others that are in the same danger with himself. So Hobbes there argues that um, in terms of um, sort of physical power, we're all basically equal. Now, I mean, Hobbes knows, right, that um, Mike Tyson is stronger than any one of us, right? But he argues here, nonetheless, there's still this relevant kind of physical equality because though Mike Tyson is stronger than any one of us, any one of us could sort of plot to attack him in his sleep and a sufficient number of us could subdue him even when awake, right? So in that way, you know, he's not sort of immune to threat by any of us, so we are relevantly physically equal. Hobbes then turns to uh, mental equality. Right? Next paragraph, he writes, And as the faculties of the mind, setting aside the arts grounded upon words, and especially that skill of proceeding upon general and infallible rules called science, which very few have, and but in few things as being not a native faculty born with us, nor attained as prudence while we look after somewhat else, I find yet a greater equality amongst men than that of strength. For prudence is but experience, which equal time equally bestows on all men, in those things they equally apply themselves unto. That which may perhaps make such equality incredible is but a vain conceit of one's own wisdom, which almost all men think they have in a greater degree than the vulgar, that is, than all men but themselves, and a few others, whom by fame or concur concurring with themselves they approve. For such is the nature of men, that howsoever they may acknowledge many others to be more witty, or more eloquent, or more learned, yet they will hardly believe there be many so wise as themselves, for they see their own wit at hand, and other men's at a distance. But this proveth rather that men are in that point equal than unequal, for there is not ordinarily a greater sign of the equal distribution of anything than that every man is contented with his share. So there Hobbes says, look, in the relevant mental respects people are equal, not this um, sort of specialized learning that he calls science, but the kind of um, common sense ability to look after oneself that he calls prudence. And he says, good evidence that people are basically equal here is that people, most people think of themselves as more sensible than the average person. That is, they're happy with their own share of good sense. And then he says, and you know, it's, it's normally a, a good sign that something's equally distributed, that everyone's happy with their share. Okay, so he's argued that people are, in the, in the relevant, crucial, physical and mental respects, basically equal. He then introduces the key motivational premises that generate conflict in a state of nature, a situation with no government or common power. Um, he sets these out in detail in the next three paragraphs, and he sort of labels them in the fourth paragraph, so that this is the four paragraphs from where we are, a little paragraph. And we might as well start with the labels. So, so in that labeling paragraph, he says, so that in the nature of man, we find three principal causes of quarrel. First, competition. Secondly, diffidence or fear, as it, people sometimes put it. 
third glory. Right? And we can look then, you know, once we've got the labels, we can sort of look back at these in turn. Right? Um, so begin with the motive Hobbes in that uh, little labeling paragraph caused competition. So this is the next paragraph from where we were under the heading from equality precedes diffidence. So Hobbes writes, from this equality of ability ariseth equality of hope in the attaining of our ends. And therefore if any two men desire the same thing, which nevertheless they cannot both enjoy, they become enemies. And in the way to their end, which is principally their own conservation and sometimes their delectation only, endeavor to destroy or subdue one another. And from hence it comes to pass that where an invader hath no more to fear than another man's single power, if one plant, sow, build, or possess a convenient seat, others may probably be expected to come prepared with forces united to dispossess and deprive him, not only of the fruit of his labor, but also of his life or liberty. And the invader again is in the like danger of another. So the idea here, right, the idea under, under this heading uh, competition, is that there's a scarcity of um, desirable stuff, right? Desirable places to live, decent sources of food, decent sources of water, etc. That being so, if, you know, any one person has possession of such a thing, it's going to be rational for um, other people who lack it to try and take it from them. And that, essentially, the motive to conflict that Hobbes calls competition. Okay, next, then, we get um, a motive that in that labeling paragraph gets called uh, diffidence or fear. Right? Um, just before we get into this, I should say um, there are there are a few times where um, uh, words mean something different in Hobbesian English than they do in modern English, right? Um, I mean, I don't know if it, it appears this way to you, but I think I can bring it into a perspective where it, you'll see what I mean. Um, I mean. Hobbes's English is strikingly like contemporary English, right? I mean, there are very, f you know, it, I mean, it's clearly the same language, right? Um, and, I mean, to put that in historical perspective, right, this was written three and a half centuries ago, right? Um, what, what, what are Chaucer's dates? Anyone, anyone I mean, anyone know offhand? It's a, it, Chaucer's stuff is written about 1300, isn't it? Something like that, is that right? Did they make you guys study Chaucer in high school? No? Terror. Terror. I don't remember, yeah, I remember anything about it. Yeah. I, I mean, it's roughly then, anyways. I mean, it's good enough, good enough for the point I want to make, right? I mean, if you've ever read Chaucer, right, early English literature written about 1300, you really sort of have to translate it, right? I mean, it's really, uh, you know, I mean, you sort of get the idea and stuff, but it's really a very different thing, and it, you know, it's. It, you know, you can't straightforwardly read the stuff at all, right? I mean, that was written, um, you know, Leviathan Hobbes is about halfway between Chaucer and now, right? So it's striking sort of how much the language changes between Chaucer and Hobbes and how little the language changes between Hobbes and us, right? But there are, you know, there are a few little changes. Um, one of those uh, you want to have in mind when we're looking at this next paragraph, right? Um, that's a change in the meaning of the word anticipation, right? As we use the word anticipation, it just sort of means looking forward to, right? In Hobbesian English, anticipation means having a first strike policy, right? That is, it means attacking other people before they attack you. All right. So with that proviso, then, um, here's what Hobbes says in this next paragraph. Starting from where we were again, th this is the one that's in the labeling paragraph. This is the motive that's going to come under the heading uh, diffidence or fear. He writes, And from this diffidence of one another, 
There is no way for any man to secure himself so reasonable of anticipation. That is, by force or wiles, to master the persons of all men he can, so long till he see no other power great enough to endanger him. <coughs> and this is no more than his own conservation requireth, and is generally allowed. Also, because there be some that, taking pleasure in contemplating their own power in the acts of conquest, which they pursue further than their security requires, if others that otherwise would be glad to be at ease within modest bounds should not by invasion increase their power, they would not be able, long time, by standing only on their defense to subsist. And by consequence, such augmentation of dominion over men being necessary to man's conservation, it ought to be allowed him. Here, um, there are two importantly different elements, actually. Um, let me sketch them out and then say a bit more about why they're importantly different. Right? So Hobbes begins the paragraph by saying, look, I mean, given that, uh, as he's argued in the previous paragraph, if you have anything desirable, you're liable to be attacked, right? it's sensible for you to try to make yourself a less tempting target. And how do you make yourself a less tempting target? Well, you make yourself a less tempting target by um, preemptively attacking other people and getting them on your side, right? You subdue them and you get, you know, you, you get them to um, now be committed to defending you. And that means that attacking you is no longer attacking one person, it's attacking three people or five people or seven people or something, and so you're a less tempting target. Then in the latter half of the paragraph, he introduces this new element. It's these uh, some who take pleasure in contemplating their own power in the acts of conquest, which they pursue further than their security requires. So these are some people who sort of just like fighting. Right? And if there are some people around who just like fighting, the thought is, um, then it's even more important for other people who don't like fighting to make themselves less tempting targets. Okay, come back then to the reason those are importantly different. Right? The reason is this. Um, Hobbes has a view about rational motives. He has a view about what sorts of motivation it's sensible for a person to have. That His basic view is it's and we'll see this reflected in his definition of a law of nature a little later on, but I mean, his basic view is what it's rational for you to um, want is whatever contributes to preserving your life, right? That means that, you know, the motive he talked about in the, under the heading of competition and sort of the first half of what he talks about under the um, heading of diffidence looks like, by his lights, a rational motive, right? In both cases, it looks like this is a motive had by people who are just concerned about preserving their own life. Right? By contrast, in the second part of this paragraph we've just looked at, he introduces what looks to be, by his lights, an irrational motive, right? He, look, he introduces explicitly the idea that there are some people who just like fighting and, and fight even where it doesn't contribute to their security. Right? And that, for Hobbes, is really almost tantamount to saying they fight even when it's not rational. Right? So, sort of the first half of that paragraph in, involves conflict generated by a motive that is, by Hobbes's lights, rational. The second half involves conflict generated by a motive that is not, by his lights, rational. All right, he then introduces a third motive in the next paragraph. This is the motive which, again, in that summary paragraph, gets labeled glory, right? Hobbes writes, Again, men have no pleasure, but on the contrary, a great deal of grief, in keeping company, where there is no power able to overawe them all. For every man looketh that his companion should value him at the same rate he sets upon himself. And upon all signs of contempt or undervaluing, naturally endeavours as far as he dares, which amongst them that have no common power to keep them in quiet is far enough to make them destroy each other, to extort a greater value from his condemners by damage, 
and from others by the example. So here Hobbes says people care about others' opinion of them and they'll attack others when they see those others show them signs of disrespect. We can again raise the question whether the motive here is one that is by Hobbes's light rational. I think he's less explicit about that in this paragraph than he was in the previous paragraph, but still on balance seems to me clear the answer is no, right? I mean, it's true that some concern for your reputation is rational if your aim is to preserve yourself, right? I mean, if you have a reputation for toughness, then people will be less likely to attack you. But, though it's not entirely explicit, I think when you read this paragraph, it's clear that Hobbes has in mind a concern for reputation which goes beyond what would be required just in order to, you know, have a reputation for toughness to contribute to your security, right? He has in mind rather people who are, you know, concerned for their reputation for its own sake, right? So again, I think the motive that Hobbes relies on here is a motive that is, by his lights, irrational. So then, Hobbes has argued that people are basically equal and set out these motives that in a state of nature situation with no government or common power lead such basically equal people to conflict. He goes on then to explicitly draw the conclusion that he's aiming to support in this section, namely the conclusion that a state of nature will be what he calls a state of war, and he articulates just what he means by such a state of war, and then finally he goes on to tell you why that's really bad for everybody. Right? Start off though with the explicit drawing of the conclusion that um, a state of nature is a state of war and the articulation of just what that means. This is um, Oh, two paragraphs further than we were under the heading, out of civil states there is always war of everyone against everyone. Hobbes writes, Hereby it is manifest that during the time men live without a common power to keep them all in all, they are in that condition which is called war, and such a war as is of every man against every man. For war consisteth not in battle only, or the act of fighting, but in a tract of time wherein the will to contend by battle is sufficiently known. And therefore the notion of time is to be considered in the nature of war as it is in the nature of weather. For as the nature of foul weather lieth not in a shower or two of rain, but in an inclination thereto of many days together, so the nature of war consisteth not in actual fighting, but in the known disposition thereto, during all the time there is no assurance to the contrary. All other time is peace. So there then Hobbes first explicitly sort of articulates the conclusion a state of nature is going to be a state of war. Right? He then tells you in rather more detail what he means by a state of war by comparing a state of war with a state of bad weather. Right? His point is this, a state of bad weather is not a situation where it's absolutely always raining. Right? It's rather a situation where sort of it's raining quite a lot of the time and it's always liable to start raining even if it isn't raining right now. Right? Similarly, he wants to say, a state of war isn't a situation where you're absolutely always fighting. It's rather a situation where you're fighting quite a lot of the time, and any time you're not fighting, you're always liable to be fighting, you know, in the next instant. In that sense, then, Hobbes claims that he's shown a state of nature is going to be a state of war. Then... In 
Oh, the most famous paragraph in all his work, people who know essentially nothing else about Hobbes can sometimes come close to quoting the final part of this paragraph. Right? Hobbes tells you why such a state of war is bad for everyone. Right? Uh, so this is under the heading, um, the incommodities of such a war, in our extract. He writes, Whatsoever, therefore, is consequent to a time of war, where every man is enemy to every man, the same is consequent to the time wherein men live without other security than what their own strength and their own invention shall furnish them withal. In such condition there is no place for industry, because the fruit thereof is uncertain, and consequently no culture of the earth, that's agriculture, right? no navigation nor use of the commodities that may be imported by sea, no commodious building, no instruments of moving and removing such things as require much force. No knowledge of the face of the earth. No account of time. No arts, no letters, no society. And, which is worst of all, continual fear and danger of violent death. And the life of man, solitary, poor, nasty, brutish, and short. So, Hobbes argues, right, a state of nature is going to be a state of war and life's there going to be very bad for everybody, right? So that gives, you know, sort of everybody a powerful motive to want to avoid this. So that's, um, that's the first half, right, of Hobbes' argument, what we put under the heading of the problem, and that's um, a good point at which to stop for a little break.